Schwab Advisor Services is proud to support the RIA Edge podcast and equally proud to support independent financial advisors like you. In a challenging year, how did 68% of firms surveyed in Schwab's RIA benchmarking study meet or exceed their new client goals? By following key success factors, such as leveraging new technology, adapting strategies to win new business and stay connected with their clients, while also attracting and developing the right talent. The Schwab RIA benchmarking study is just one of many ways they provide you with the insights and resources needed to succeed and grow. Get the full picture at advisorservices.schwab.com. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the RIA Edge podcast. I'm David Armstrong, the editor-in-chief of wealthmanagement.com. And as you know, this is the podcast where I get a chance to speak to the folks who are studying and participating in the RIA industry uh, and creating firms, really, that are, are built for sustainability, for growth, growth by design, not by default. And I'm super excited today to speak to Brendan Kaywall, the managing partner at Advisor Growth Strategies. I'm just going to talk a little bit about the you know, RAA, M&A landscape and what we can expect and what we're seeing there. Brandon, thanks very much for joining us. Thanks for having me, David. Excited to be here. I appreciate it. You guys have recently released the 2024 Deal Room Report, looking back at 2023 activity in RAA, M&A, titled After the Gold Rush, which is a title I love. Uh, and one of the things that you, you said in there was the 2023 was a a year that marks a switch from kind of I guess M and A activity to uh, more institutional uh, kinds of firepower. Uh, I think you said 2023 was an inflection point for RIA M and A that saw the shift from a gold rush mentality to an institutional arms race. Do you want to take a minute and just give us a little bit of you know the the top level landscape of 2023? What you saw. Uh, some of the things that jump out in this report that uh, are, are important to you, and then we can dive a little bit more into the details. Yeah, ab- absolutely. I, I think uh, what we what we saw and in, in why we sort of chose that terminology, uh, the way we described the market, is that you're, by, by all measures, twenty twenty three should have been a slower year in RA, you know, M and A, and and why is that? Well, twenty twenty two was a very challenging year, and and for a number of Industries not not wealth management. There was a lot of choppiness and things slowed down. But what we saw is a pretty resilient M and A activity in in two thousand twenty three across the space, and that uh, I think spoke to a couple of things. I think the the first was there is just so much demand, and demand continues to chase the industry, a lot of outside capital uh, still looking to find a home and an investment and and growth here in, in the RA space. Uh, there's still a demographic shift happening from the potential seller side, you know, advisors that are aging, you know, emerging next generation talent, looking to have a meaningful role in, in the growth of, of the business. And the need for resources. So, you know, th- that's been true for several years now running. But what we, when you bring that all together, you know, I think the demand, the, su- the potential supply and and sort of um, the way the demographics have evolved in the RA space, <laughs> it begs the question, well, why, why did activity stay largely flat in 2023? And I think it was uh, this shift in thinking to address those needs, address sellers' needs for succession, but also resources and partnership, and address the buyer's needs with just this very much, you know, this huge increase in demand that we've seen over the last really decade, but very in a very acute way over the last five years. So it, it was sort of a fascinating year. We saw it as an inflection point because uh, it could have, it would be easy for some of the buyers to take a, a much more measured or uh, a slow down in 2023. But I think in a lot of ways, that wasn't of interest to anybody. Uh, and I think this, the the longer term strategic motivations for buyers, but also for sellers really shown through and it, it kept M&A activity at a, at a pretty stable level. So that resulted in Really, not a lot of changes in valuations. The median adjusted EBITDA multiple that we track year in and year out remained relatively flat, just like deal volumes. But what we did see come out of it is buyers getting very selective, very creative, sellers, you know, really spending a lot of time thinking through not just what's going to work for a founder group, but also what's going to work for a next generation team. The clients are always first, but when we think about 
the employees, you're looking at, you know, a founding generation, employees, <clears throat> multiple generations of employees that that need a exciting path to uh, progress in their career. And so deal structures were were a big impact of that, where we did see some shifting in the way deals were being constructed to kind of reflect the creativity in the space. You know, people were trying to find very, very good ways to and creative ways to bring these deals together in 2023. And, and really it all centered around this institutionalization uh, of the industry that we're starting to see very, very early. Uh, we think it's very early in that path, but um, when you when you really take a step back and look at how the industry has evolved, you know, we have firms that are, you know, well north of 100 billion in asset center management, some that are over 200 billion now, and, and some that have now hundreds or thousands of employees and that just didn't exist 10 years ago in, in our industry. So I think as you see the industry reshaping competition, it's reshaping the way growth is perceived and, and sought after. There's just a lot of room for activity in the space. So in 2023 was probably the best proof point we could see of that because it would have been, I think, very easy for an industry with, that doesn't have the drivers that we have to fall into maybe some of the the patterns of other industries that slowed down a little bit. Sure, and it, and I think it shows the the robustness of of the the business model. Uh, you know, client demand for this business model. You know, you talk about the fact that ten years ago we didn't see this kind of activity. We didn't see these players. That's very true. I remember, you know, when I started covering this space, you could count on one hand the number of RAs that had more than a billion dollars in assets. And like you say, that has just changed dramatically over the decade. Point out here in the report the, the the declining use of cash in deals and the increasing use of equity in deals, uh, and speak a little bit more to that. How deal structures are are changing and how you're seeing them change in this new new world of institutional deals. Really, you know, it makes sense that equity would be more of a uh, a factor uh, simply because the cash is becoming so you know large, right? I mean, these are, these are larger deals. Yeah, absolutely. I think there also is a scenario where, so deal structures for the third straight year that we've tracked, equity became a larger component of the deal consideration. And, you know, we did, we did see this years ago, you know, really pre-2019, we saw a much heavier use of equity in transactions and then cash really spiked up you know, starting in 2019, 2020, 2021, we called that the flight to certainty. That one was a, there was a fairly straightforward explanation in our minds that cash became, cash relative to equity was very, very cheap, um, you know, as debt, the cost of debt and, and the capital markets costs really declined. And 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 then COVID, of course, during that, the, the pandemic period, we went down even further. So, you know, that really led to these very certain heavy cash deals. And over the last two years, what we've started to see is now equity materially increasing in, in um, the deals that we're seeing. Some of that can be explained by the reversal of, you know, so maybe some of the pandemic policies and things like that we that we saw during the 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 pandemic where debt was very very inexpensive and mm. there was a lot of it was very easy to access you know that really changed in 22 so there we have to acknowledge that that was a driver of the decline of cash just more expensive than it used to be but we also think there's a, another factor at play here where you know as the industry i think looks to shift toward this institutionalization field, it it really starts to signal partnership and I think risk and growth alignment uh, across the industry. And it also signals that sellers aren't always looking for a cash out uh, because I think the demographic of firms that are interested or well, at least considering a sale it's not just made up anymore of, of firms that need a check and or need to get liquidity and and move on. It's there's a whole mix of uh, firms that are considering M and A for much more strategic reasons that would be resources, broader partnership, growth channels, you know, you name it. That they might be looking at succession 
for an owner group 10, 15 years down the road. And if that's the case, you know, uh, uh, the de, you know, a de-risking through cash is nice and everybody likes that, but you're probably also asking the question of what happens when we grow, you know, how do we share success? So I think we're seeing a little bit of buyers and sellers coming to a similar place of we want to share risk. Yes. From a buyer side, we want to share growth because we have these big aspirations for our business and we want, we need talent and really great people to be a part of that. And I think from a seller standpoint, there's a little bit of multiple bites of the apple or have your cake and eat it too sort of mentality where we can get the things we need now, still have upside and and shared success, potential for shared success with a partner. And you know, if that's the case and that's what you want, which I think more and more do in today's market, you know, you you're probably politely demanding that there be <laughs> some equity in the deal and, and ways for that growth to, or why do it, right? Why go through the transaction? So we're, we're seeing sort of a convergence, I think, of, of preferences in the space, albeit acknowledging, you know, that there's just fundamental changes in the cost of capital that drove some of this as well. Sure. And the, you know, you write in the report that sellers have more options than they've ever had before, but at the same time, the buyers aren't looking just to acquire a business, right? As you say, they're looking to grow, bring on new services, uh, maybe some areas where they're not as strong. And the notion of of buying a firm that's, you know, where you're going to just write a check and the principals are going to walk out the door, using equity brings the 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 bought firm along for the for the long term, correct? That's right. Yeah. And I think as, you know, we, we also do each year, we, we sort of vary our tactics year to year, but we try to get a pulse check with, you know, a representative uh, sample, big sample of, of a lot of the buyers in the space and, and try to get, uh, understand what they're looking for. And you're exactly right. I mean, they're, as they go and pursue deals, you know, and pursue transactions. Sure, there's a headline and, you know, you're buying this business and it comes with AUM revenue and, you know, and, and EBITDA and cash flow. But the the reality is that they're looking for is talent and they're looking for, you know, geographies and they're looking for capabilities. And, the, you know, there there's all these <clears throat> other strategic motivations that come into play. And what that, and it gets to exactly what you were saying, which is, they're not just looking, I think the the reality is aggregation in its purest form is dying. And it's that that sort of that sort of general strategy, in my opinion, is really on the decline when you meaning you're just buying businesses and trying to aggregate them together and aggregate the economics. I, I really think that's dying. It's really, really close to, I think it's end of its effectiveness in my mind. So now you're looking at thoughtful integrations, thoughtful, multiple generation, you know, strategies where buyers understand that to really achieve the value they're seeking, you need to partner with teams that are engaged. And there's some, I'll use the most overused word in M&A, so there's synergies there, you know, both on the top line and the through the expense structure. But more importantly, there's a way for everybody to have some success. And I think this is where you're seeing the equity really shine through, where it might not be, and in a lot of cases, what we've seen is it's not just for a founder group uh, mm -hmm. or a, a G1, so to speak, coming into a transaction. The This is getting targeted and these growth incentives and equity and long-term alignment are getting really aimed at the next generation of talent. Right? How do we keep them excited and engaged and give them a path for growth through this? Because that's what we're really after as a buyer, right? If I'm a buyer, that's what I'm really after is bringing this team in and, and keeping them engaged, giving them the resources they need and helping uh, them helping us perpetuate our growth strategy. Uh, so you're right. It's not just about aggregating and sort of snapping up these businesses I think there was a time where that worked, you know, more effectively. I, I think those days are are numbered. Yeah, that makes a, a lot of sense. And and particularly as the the new sources of capital come into the space who understand 
uh, that M and A is about one plus one equaling more than two. Uh, otherwise, why do it? And you write here in the the to your, to your point about the next generation in the report that the topic of next generation incentives in a transaction serves as a warning to RIAs that fail to consider long term incentives, plan now or pay later. What did you mean by that? Yeah, the what we meant by that is you know there. Sometimes I think it's lost when you look at M and A and in the in the activity levels that we've seen in this space. You know, there's and you look at headlines and you look at what most people are talking about at conferences. It's M and A is a big, big topic, and a lot of times I think you can it can kind of lull you to sleep around. You know that that that's it's always there for um your succession needs and you know could potentially be a band-aid for you know some of the things particularly around succession planning and long-term incentives and things that you know you you know you need to plan for to have a sustainable business and you know there and the likelihood is look for here right now it's here so we that's true so that it's a solution for for teams that are out there that need a, an exit. And, and that's all very true. But I think where the market has now shifted to is again, kind of going back to that buyer mindset is if you're, if you're looking for engaged teams, one of the things that buyers are looking at is what tools, what tactics uh, are you using to engage your next generation? And will they be engaged through this transaction? Or do we need to collectively do something to resolve that? And if you take a step back just from the whole industry, there we're built on independence, right? The RA space is built on independently sustainable businesses. There's thousands and thousands of them today. You know, there are large, medium, small, there's practices, you name it. So when you look at that, well, the, how does that independent sustainability continue? It's through the use of equity, right? And equity recycling. And we we think that is a just critically important, and it's not talked about enough, that everybody has a responsibility, you know, to attempt to make their business sustainable, even if M&A becomes your best solution. Because now what's happening is, I think buyers are looking at it and saying, well, you can't make your problem our problem completely. We need to figure out how to solve this together. So when we say pay for it now, pay for it later, really what we mean is if you know you you can kick the can, but now buyers are much more likely, politely of course, in conversations. We can't just assume that your team is not going to have any equity, right? And you know we're yes we're buying the business, but you're going to have to share in this a little bit, right? So mm -hmm. we're going to have to figure this out together. So we kind of described in the report as a shadow market um, of negotiations that we see on the ground that where you know firms are getting into transactions and almost having to resolve those things they didn't resolve, whether that be equity or some sort of uh, meaningful incentive for their teams, something to keep get everybody excited because we for we forget that this will have to be solved at some point. And even the biggest firms in our space have a partnership mentality, right? They they know that equity and long-term incentives are an incredibly powerful tool, especially when you're asking somebody to, you know, at least in concept, commit to the next 20 years, 30 years of their career sure. with you. You know, you got to have something more than uh, what they're making today. And so... That I think will be a fascinating trend that develops in the space because someone has to solve the equity recycling piece. Big firms have a thesis for it. all of them have it, you know. So what I think is now you see a, or we're seeing in the space is, you know, they're not going to they're not going to take that risk all on their own that your team wasn't taken care of through succession. They're going to want you to participate in that, and so yeah, it's kind of solve it now or at least think about it now and put a plan in place or. You know, you get to that inflection point, and the likelihood is you're going to have to solve it then. Or yeah. what what happens? Talent walks. We are a talent constrained industry still today. Um, the RA space is still facing significant talent issues, so nobody wants those those really good contributors to have incentives to leave. And if you're a buyer, you probably place a higher premium on firms where the second generation is excited to participate in future growth more so than other firms. 
Yeah, that's right. And we this year we did something a little different. You know, to what, uh, earlier in uh, 2024, we we said um, we went to uh, 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 more than a dozen buyers in the space and we confidentially pulled them essentially. And we did case studies uh, because one of the things we were noticing in our work is maybe two, three years ago, and this is that shift from the gold rush to to something, to institutionalization, you know, two, three years ago, if you had a firm that was for sale, you could probably go to 15, 20 different potential buyers and every one of them would probably want to make a run at it. That's just not the case. It just hasn't been the case over the last 12 months or particularly 12 months in, in 23, where like you said, buyers were getting a little, we're getting a lot more selective. And, and to what you were saying is, it's not only a premium, it might be the difference between a buyer actually pursuing an opportunity with you to partner with you, depending on the level of business building you've done and the engagement, you know, with your, with your team. Cause it's just a, you know, if we try to map where buyers say their most important factor is a talent, right. It, through their M&A strategy, and you try to map that to risk factors, well, uh, disengaged or potentially lack <laughs> you know, lack of engagement with the team through your, through equity, through compensation, through the combination of those things, that, that could be a very big risk factor for a lot of buyers. So they might just pass on the opportunity. And now you, 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 we saw that a bit through the case studies where firms that really struggle with growth or really didn't have much of a bench, you know, the, when we asked firms to buyers to evaluate it, there, there was a strong reaction to those firms on paper to say, you know, not sure we would go down this path because that it doesn't fit our strategy and our strategy is to build the partnership and really, uh, you know, we're, we're going to pay fairly and we need to, you know, do all those things. But um, really what's in it over the long haul for us is to uh, pursue these, pursue these teams that we can engage in and build our talent around, uh, build, build our talent. And so, all that to be said, yes, the, you know, I think the premium is there. And in some cases, I think going forward, whether there's a bid there at all could depend on how much business building you've done, um, yeah. or at least that you're prepared to do in the conversations. We invite you to join us on May 13th through 16th in Hollywood, Florida, for RA Edge, part of the Wealth Management Edge event. With an agenda designed to help accelerate the growth of your RAA firm with the latest C-suite strategies, you'll walk away with frameworks and approaches for M&A, organic growth, and talent development. Use promo code PODCAST20 to save 20% on your registration. Visit wealthmanagementedge-event.com for more information. Does this solve a problem for RAAs? Uh, that are getting to a certain size and that it used to be the principals would offer equity to the juniors, uh, allow them to buy into the firm over a period of time as kind of a succession plan. The firms are getting larger and those equity buy-ins are becoming much more expensive. And it's, I think, sometimes difficult for junior advisors to to afford to buy into a firm. Uh, is this solving that problem or or how does that dynamic play into what you're seeing? Yeah, I think the that that's absolutely right. And that's the main conundrum that's come up over the last several years. It's always been there, but it's become very acute. And it's the affordability, accessibility of equity in these businesses. And, you know, the 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 MA space and, you know, uh, the way that MA has really exploded has put a lot of pressure on internal succession plans. So I think. Um, one of the part of that's affordability. The other part of it is success, internal succession always requires a level of compromise, both from selling owners and buying uh, contributors. That you know, there's some risk, you know, risk and upside and risk and you know, valuation that always comes into play. The gap that exists there now is very, very big. So I think to your point, that that's still there, and it can put a lot of pressure on. And lower the probability that an internal succession plan can work all the way through. I think this does help in in some regards. It's you know one of those things where you know we are seeing partnerships that hey we've given internal succession a go, we've gotten equity in the hands of our team. Our team has said that's enough. But we're not we don't want to buy more or 
you know, we collectively agreed that th- this was about as far as we could take it on our own and, and a partnership can be the next step in that conversation. And, and so really this is for anybody who's listening and thinking through their internal plan, this is not, hey, you have to be able to transition the business 100% from founder or G1 to G2 or whatever generation of ownership you're on um, completely and fully. But it is about the progress toward how do people participate in the long-term success of business, whether it's standalone or you end up joining in a partnership. That That's the main, I think, pressure point we're seeing now is even if you do go to the M&A market, buyers will have a thesis for that and they're going to want you to participate in it. So the more work you've done ahead of that, the better it is. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Do you have any, looking at some of the firms that did these kinds of things, reflection on how they're structured, these equity deals, you know, I characterize it however you like. I mean, is there a percentage of uh, of total uh, book value that's, you know, distributed to employees or or second generation? Uh, how, how do they most often work? Yeah, there's there's a couple of different ways that we're seeing equity sort of move from one to the other. I think in, in some cases, it's just a really looking at an internal valuation and moving, you know, targeting an amount that you'd like to get to the next generation. For one of the one of the tactics that's been used for a while, and we're, we see it come up in a lot of transactions, is just almost think like a transition incentive where, hey, we're going through this transaction, everybody's excited. You know, a founder wants to make it very exciting for their next generation team. So, you know, or a current ownership group. So there's some level of of consideration that's essentially shared with the with the team. In some cases, you can use that uh, for the right people uh, to essentially take equity um, in the transaction. There's some nuances in it, but they're whether it's sort of a pseudo buy-in or you know some sort of grant or really looking at and and for some cases by the way it might not have to be equity for and it usually is not equity for everybody on the team but i think being able to tar- being able to map the right level of incentive to the right roles in your business meaning that could be a a, a one time bonus it could be an increase in compensation, a change in benefits. That there's a number of different things that could result in an exciting outcome for team members that that's not equity, but your most key people usually have to have some meaningful incentive that is either cash and then I choose to use it towards equity or I'm actually getting equity through the deal. Um, so a lot of times it's a purchase to answer your question uh, of some kind. Um, how you engineer that, it's kind of all over the map. We've we've done it mm-hmm. a lot of different ways, but it's it's generally to get people's skin in the game because I think for a, the next generation mindset is, you know, they know that a founding generation or a current owner generation that they're going to be just fine for this transaction. Like they know that they're excited for them. And in most cases, what they're what the question they're asking is they also know this is a very big inflection point in the business that they're used to, right? We're, we're doing a sale or we're merging in with somebody else. So having some skin in the game that persists and says, hey, you know what? I, I have a real participation in this. It's a powerful message for the right people on the on the team. Good for the buyer, good for the, the current owners that are may have plans to step away or may want to keep going. It doesn't really matter. It's just good for everybody when those folks don't see this as the end, they see it as a, a 2.0 versus of, of the business versus, hey, this is a, this is kind of where it all comes to a head for us. Sure. You talked a little bit about uh, equity recycling, the issue there. And, and I think one of the things we saw over the past year, and you mentioned here in the report, is the seeming inability for firms to break out of the private equity, private investor world into the public markets and maybe uh, monetize some of this equity. You know, we, we saw CI Financial pull back from its, you know, planned public offering, Focus Financial went private. How how does, re- reflect a little bit for us on on that, those scenarios and, and where you see kind of the end game for equity in RAs going. 
Yeah, it's uh, and that was the other fascinating thing we really saw late 22 into 23 was sort of this this overall shift in what I, you know, we would consider exit options or liquidity options. And you, you, you nailed it. I think that you've got, you know, CI now Corient, you know, pulling back from the IPO market and instead doing a transaction with, you know, a, an investor group led by Bain. You've got, you know, you had Focus Financial going private and ultimately acknowledging, you know, through their investment with CDNR, CDNR that, you know, the public markets wasn't quite, they, they just weren't quite valuing that business the way that they, they should. And there was more value to be had in the private markets. So all, all things point to the private markets right now. You know, there's large, you know, you're now seeing the emergence of large pools of capital that are very interested in this space, whether that be pensions or sovereign funds led by private equity. And, and you have family offices that are really, um, active here along with traditional private equity. And so, you know, you, you do have sort of a, and, and the emergence of specialist investors, right? Where, you know, so a lot of private capital chasing after this space. And I think that's where you'll see the exit options and liquidity options for the foreseeable future. I do think that the IPO option will come back at some point. I think what we need is a really, really strong, fully integrated wealth management platform to make that leap and have success. And then I think the floodgates kind of open. Mm -hmm. uh, right now, by most measures, at least the last time we did this analysis, you know, there, there's a 40 to 50% difference in some cases of the absolute valuations you're seeing in the private markets to what you were seeing in the public markets. Now those reference points are gone because they're going private, but it, it, the valuation itself and the uh, there's all the traditional factors, you know, the scrutiny that comes with the public markets, the reporting, the, you know, maybe some of the, the limitations on flexibility, those types of things. But I think in just purely from the mechanical standpoint, the private markets are valuing these businesses in a much more robust way than they could achieve on the, in, on the public side. That said, I, I, you know, I think for the foreseeable future, where you're going to see the answer to liquidity around around this equity, is through the private markets, and I think what that means is there's going to be more pressure to build large partnerships, not less, right? Because if you're a private investor investing in one of these platforms, and you, you know, a diverse ownership group with multiple generations is a good thing, right? For your exit, but also for the valuation of that business whenever that comes up next. And so, you know, or maybe the IPO does come around. Um, so I think you'll see investors continue to, to drive this theme where you'll see, you know, this sort of equity recycling internally uh, with with their help, but also a broadening of ownership tables, right? Where you're going to, where it won't be, 10 or 20 owners, it'll be 100, 200, mm -hmm. 300 mm -hmm. owners in these businesses. And it's already out there, right? Where um, some of these larger firms, you know, have have been on the record and, you know, sort of talked about how many, you know, in generalities, how many owners they have in the business. And I think that's a net positive, but it's a signal where value is being created and protected. You know, equity is uh, in these broader ownership tables is one tactic to do it. So I, I think those investors are saying, you know, look, we know if we know when we go to do our next transaction, like they're not going to be around forever. They we we know this, right? The five to seven years they're going to need to be out, maybe even sooner. So they're going to do all the things necessary and influence all the changes necessary to protect value and build value. Um, but they also know if that IPO option does come around, the public markets will view this as positive as well, right? Where you have, you know, a large partnership of um, engaged professionals that are driving the advice for and investors forward. And I think that's a, a positive message all the way around. So that we just think this is going to become more acute, not less. And then, you know, going to the, back to the exit options, who knows when that IPO conversation comes back around, but the one that'll drive it will be, you know, what'll drive it will be the, it'll take one of these really, really successful and I think fully integrated. And who knows, maybe it's focused when they're done with all their changes 
you know, goes back to the public markets, but somebody in a very integrated way will go to the market. And I think that will be a stronger message for Wall Street than maybe what we saw in the past. Yeah, for sure. And certainly a lot of smart money coming into the space. I mean, you know, we talk about the rise of the strategic investors, the rise capital, right? Uh, merchant, uh, some of the immigrant banks and these these folks. Are, are they changing the landscape at all? Uh, you know, they these are smart people. They know what they're doing. What are they thinking when they're making their investments? How are they yeah, changing? They, they, they are changing things. I think, um, you know, we, we sort of described as this, like, there's, we see the emergence of the minority or <clears throat> specialist investor structure, um, probably more try to participate there. You know, uh, Rise, I think is a good example. Constellation uh, cap, Wealth Capital is another example you know, there, I think we'll see more of that, you know, uh, really smart industry um, participants, you know, backed by, you know, private capital, uh, looking to make investments and in really and in, in drive growth in the middle market, more, you know, in the, of the RA space, what we consider the new middle of the RA space. And, you know, that they are changing things because I think it used to be, you know, hey, get to get to a certain size um get really big raise capital get you know get bigger raise more capital but i think the availability of that capital was constrained by size at at some point i think now these investors are much more broad they're they're taking a casting a broader net they want to, i think what they'd like to do is back the next wave of large platforms in the space and that probably starts with firms that are two, three, four billion, you used to not be able to raise private equity or take private equity money at, you know, two billion. It used to be very difficult. I think now these firms are seeking more options down, down market to grow that next two to 20, sort of two to 20 billion AUM type of, uh, of strategy. And then they've, they've, a lot of them come from companies that have you know, obviously, uh, Rise is a great example. You have somebody who went through this and grew to twenty billion and saw what that took, and you know what the, that journey looked like. And so, I, I think you you have really smart participants coming in, capitals backing them too to de, to to help them deploy their capital. So now you have industry specialists along with institutional knowledge behind them, and that that is changing things because now I think the they're not thinking from two to three billion of AUM. They're thinking two to 20, two to 30. And then, you know, they also know that there's a point of absolute size and success that qualifies as sort of a scaled platform, right? And it's not what it used to be. Uh, you know, I think we, you made the comment, you count on one hand years and years ago, you know, firms that were over a billion, that was really big. Then it was like 5 billion. And then, you know, in some cases, 10 billion. I mean, now really these, the, you know, sort of sustainable size is 20, 30 plus billion of AUM and, and very significant process and platform creation and all those things. And these investors know it and they're going to try to take more firms to that level. So we're going to see a lot of competition in what we consider the new middle market. And these investors will be right in the mix of that, right? Because they'll be backing the the firms and helping them that they think are the next wave of platforms in the RA space. Yep. Well, this has been great. I know we're pushing up against the uh, end of our time, but uh, the increased use of equity for second generation key to retaining talent. This has been fantastic conversation. We could talk about this forever, Brandon. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and I suspect we will in the future uh, continue the conversation. I hope so. Thanks very much for joining us. I'd recommend anyone read the report. Uh, Advisor Growth Strategies, you guys are pretty generous, uh, putting a lot of uh, intelligence out there for free on your website. So I'd recommend people go and, and read it if they haven't. Uh, it's good stuff. Uh, thank you very much for joining us on the podcast. Thanks, David. Appreciate having me and look forward to chatting again soon. Absolutely. And thank you for listening. This has been the RA Edge podcast. Schwab Advisor Services is proud to support the RIA Edge podcast and equally proud to support independent financial advisors like you. In a challenging year, how did 68% of firms surveyed in Schwab's RIA benchmarking study meet or exceed their new client goals? By following key success factors, such as leveraging new technology, adapting strategies to win new business and stay connected with their clients, while also attracting and developing the right talent. The Schwab RIA benchmarking study is just one of many ways they provide you with the insights and resources needed to succeed and grow. 
Get the full picture at advisorservices.schwab.com.